Good morning and welcome to worship today at Grace Lutheran here in Boone. I'm Pastor Steve and on behalf of our whole congregation would like to welcome you as we gather for digital worship this morning. It's been a busy few days. Uh, beginning on Thursday, we had our North Carolina Synod Assembly and our major item of business there was the election of a bishop. And so I'm pleased to announce for those of you who haven't already seen this on Facebook or other places, that Bishop Tim Smith, former pastor here at Grace, was elected to serve a second term, a second six-year term. Uh, so that is wonderful news that we can celebrate uh, for both us and our connection with Bishop Tim, but also for our entire synod and the wonderful work that he is doing for God's kingdom in this state. Yesterday, I got a chance to drive down to South Carolina and participate in the ordination of Christopher Sheely, our last vicar here, now Pastor Christopher. And today, he will begin serving Mount Hebron Lutheran Church in Leesville, South Carolina. Finally, this afternoon, we will hold a special funeral service for Beth Miller, a member here at Grace. This will be our first in-person worship service here for a funeral in the sanctuary. We will be providing an online live stream version available through a Zoom link that came in your email. So look out for that if you haven't seen it already and you can join a few minutes early and participate in that service in a digital way as well. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? 
share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. All-powerful God, in Jesus Christ you turned death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Psalms. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, in order that you may be feared. I wait for you, O Lord. My soul waits. In your word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who keep watch for the morning. More than those who keep watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord there is plenteous redemption. For the Lord shall redeem Israel from all their sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from 2 Corinthians. Life in the present is transitory and cannot compare with the eternal home God has prepared for us.
So we do not despair, no matter what life might bring, because we know that as God raised Jesus from the dead, God promises to bring us into eternal life. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed, and so I spoke, We also believe, and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal." For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went home, and the crowds came together again, so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan had risen up against himself and is divided, He cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As we hear our Gospel lesson read aloud this morning, it should stick out as being a somewhat familiar and also strange passage from Mark. There are a couple quotable lines that we pick up throughout, like houses divided against themselves and those who do God's will, well, those are my brother's sister and mother. But when we read it in context, it's quite an odd series of events in the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus is accused of being in cahoots with Satan, maybe even Satan himself. And his own family comes to take him away from his followers because they believe he's lost his mind. And Jesus refuses to even go out and address his family and instead speaks about them from inside 
seeming to disavow his own blood in favor of his own disciples. I can imagine that over the years, a passage like what we've read today has been probably used in some pretty destructive ways, especially as we think about a passage that talks about uh, unforgivable sins, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So it seems to me it would be important for us to make sure we take a little closer look at exactly what's happening in our text. And I think we'll better understand what causes Jesus to respond so directly and firmly with both the scribes and his family. So first, we are reading from Mark's gospel. For the last several weeks, we've been bouncing around to all sorts of different gospels. We'll hopefully get a chance to ride in Mark now for a while. Mark is a unique gospel in that Jesus' ministry begins at his baptism, but it's not just that. That what happens when Jesus begins his ministry is that the very kingdom of God begins to emerge uh, in and among the people. I've heard some commentators talk about it as uh, the kingdom of God is dawning into creation in the ministry of Jesus. In Mark's gospel, then, Jesus is presented as the one who stands in between this cosmic battle of God's reign entering creation and the rulers of this world battling against. And so Jesus is presented not just as one who heals bodily illness, but particularly in Mark's gospel, he's one that has power over evil spirits and can cast out demons. In fact, Mark has the most exorcisms of any of the Gospels, and yet has, is the shortest in its description of Jesus' ministry. This third chapter in Mark's Gospel is pretty action-packed. Uh, Jesus casts out demons. Uh, he calls the rest of the disciples to get the number up to 12. The crowds start to gather. He contends with Pharisees and the supporters of King Herod. As our story picks up today, Jesus has retreated after some contention with the Pharisees, and he's teaching in a home. And the crowds are pressing in on him and the disciples so much that they can't even stop and eat. And that's when two groups of people approach. One group are the scribes. The other is Jesus' own family. The scribes come leveling some pretty big accusations. They're saying that Jesus himself is Satan, Beelzebub. But if not Satan, he is serving the interests of the evil one. And this is their explanation of sorts to the crowds who had witnessed Jesus casting out demons. It's how they make sense of the fact that Jesus seems to have power over these things that possess people. They believe that the only way that Jesus could have such power if he were the king of all the evil spirits, Satan himself, and then he'd have the ability to control them. Jesus' reply pokes a little hole in that logic, suggesting that demons, the individual demons that Jesus contends with, are actually an extension of Satan himself. And therefore, if he were Satan, then he wouldn't be able to cast out himself. And this is the part where Jesus then talks about houses divided amongst themselves. That line that we usually associate with Abraham Lincoln in his speeches leading up to the Civil War actually come from Jesus and, curiously, have to do with his explanation for why he could not be Satan. Jesus then goes on to reply that the only reason that he has power over dark spirits is because his power comes from another source, a source that is opposite and greater, namely the Spirit of God. The scribes attempt to discredit Jesus and disperse the growing crowds. Well, it's all thwarted as Jesus points out that he has access to a deeper source of wisdom and power. 
This will become a major point of contention between Jesus and the religious leaders as they wonder from where he gets the authority to speak. And all along, Jesus will make the same claim, that he is one uniquely connected to God and uniquely animated by the Spirit of God at work in creation. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He doesn't just poke holes in the scribes' logic. He actually turns back on them in a pretty aggressive way. He suggests that what the scribes are accusing him of borders on blaspheming the Holy Spirit and suggests that that's the most grievous of sin, maybe the only thing that could be unforgivable. More specifically, it's this suggestion that God's Spirit, alive and at work in the world, well, when we call that the power of darkness, when we call what's good evil, we deny the presence of God in this creation. We deny the working of the Spirit. And in doing so, turn away from the grace and renewal of God happening among us. There's a sense in which Jesus is saying that when we turn our hearts away from God, then yes, there is no forgiveness. I still don't know how that jives with other things I hear in the gospel, and even how it relates to Jesus' own family. A question that has plagued theologians for many centuries is, is it possible to do something or say something that is so unforgivable that it would move you so far away from the presence of God that that distance could never be reconciled by God's mercy. Some argue that it's impossible to get that much distance between yourself and God. Other, others will say in a real practical way, it seems folks have chosen to turn away from God. Now, whether that's an eternal choice or a temporary choice is yet to be figured out. But it certainly means that when Jesus is talking to the scribes, the things he is accusing them of have very serious consequences. So that brings us to the other group, Jesus' own family. They come, it seems, almost genuinely concerned about Jesus' safety. Uh, the word that's used there in the Greek where they come to take him away is the same word for arresting. It's the same word that'll be what happens to Jesus in the garden. They're actually looking to come and take him, maybe even by force, shuffle him away. Again, a charitable view of that is it's in his own best interests. They believe he's lost his mind, and they want to get him to safety before something more dangerous happens. It's Jesus' words to his own family that could be the most unsettling we hear today, though. Jesus says, in effect, my family includes those who follow me, those who do God's will, and the ties of blood are inconsequential when it comes to working in God's kingdom, that the ministry that Jesus calls people to is far stronger than blood itself. By failing to enter the house to speak to Jesus, his family is choosing not to be a part of his ministry, and therefore not to be a part of this new family that Jesus is creating, what we'll later call the body of Christ, thanks to Paul's writings. These two groups, the scribes and the family of Jesus, well, they have the same goal. They want to get Jesus to stop it. Their reasons, though, are very different. The scribes seem intent to cast Jesus as one who works alongside the powers of darkness. The family, on the other hand, seems that they are more interested in Jesus' safety or maybe even keeping the peace. And they want to stop Jesus from going down a dangerous road. They both want Jesus to stop, but their reasons are different. So that left me thinking as I was reading through the text over and over again, wondering what I would say this morning. Where do we fit in to this story, this odd collection of teachings of Jesus and contention stories? When we read texts from the Bible, we read stories, we usually associate with somebody. Often it's a disciple or someone who's healed. 
In this case, it's a little problematic. Are we to associate ourselves with Jesus or maybe the disciples in the house? I guess I'd like for us to hear this from the perspective of the scribes and the family. And maybe to use their, let's say, poor choices to help drive us toward a life of faith in community. Here's one of the challenges I see in the world around us today. We are really quick, it seems to me, to demonize the persons with whom we disagree. We live in such a divided time that it's not so much that we disagree about ideas or perspectives, but that we have to tear down the people with whom we disagree, calling them evil in many circumstances. It's really not so different than what the scribes are trying to do to Jesus. Naming him as a source of evil is the way that they're going to win the battle for the people, the crowds that follow Jesus. I think we probably, as a society, need to take more seriously our call to love our neighbor, to cast their actions in charitable lights, and also to not go so far as calling them evil just because we have a different perspective. Likewise, with Jesus' family, I think there's a sense in which we could associate with their concern, that maybe what they see is the writing on the wall, and all they want to do is keep the peace, whatever the cost may be. They just want to smooth things out, even if they have to take Jesus away. I imagine there's lots of folks who at times have bitten their tongue in challenging conversations, allowed folks to say things that, that were hateful or mean or unhelpful or wrong, and decided not to intervene just to keep the peace. In a similar way, we are called to move toward those who are equally doing the will of God, and that the calling of the life of disciples is to do God's will, not to keep the peace, not to make people happy. And what we see in these two groups that come to Jesus is the balancing act of what it means to be the people of God, especially in this divided time. We're called not to demonize our neighbor with whom we disagree, and yet at the same time, we're not called to just bite our tongue and try to keep the peace. Instead, we are called to move in the directions that God is leading us, to prayerfully consider what the will of God would be in our own lives and in the life of the world, and to move with haste in that direction. This kingdom of God that is dawning in our midst in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus continues to sweep through the creation in which we live. Our voices and hands are needed to continue the work of healing and helping those in our community and those throughout the world who are in desperate need of something more, some kind of hope to hold on to, some kind of healing, whatever that may be. Our calling as people of faith is to move forward in love, refusing to relent when we hear the clear call of God in Jesus, when we are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and yet when it leads us to places of conflict, not to demonize our neighbor, but instead look for our points of connectivity, see them as a brother, sister, or mother, the same family of God working toward this will of God, this kingdom of God emerging in our midst. Amen.
with the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our prayers of the Church for today were prepared by Dana Holden. Let us come before God in prayer. God, our leader, you call men, women, and children to serve your church. Strengthen those who answer your call that they may serve faithfully. Bless all those around the world who seek to speak your word and bring your kingdom. Be with those who do not know your name, but who labor in your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our creator, you made all things and call them good, and placed us in a garden that will supply our needs if we only care for it. In this season of planting and growing, bless all who provide us with food. Empower those who meet our needs that we may be healthy. Help us to protect and preserve your good creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our King, you show us the way that we should work together in society. Raise up leaders who care more for the good of all than for themselves. Bring unity to our division, for a house divided against itself cannot stand. Lead each of us to serve our community where we can. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, we see our outer nature wasting away. Renew our inner nature day by day. Bless all who suffer, especially those with mental illness, disability, impaired relationships, and those who are oppressed. Guide us to minister to those around us in need. Hear our prayers for those we name aloud and those we lift up to you in silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of eternity, in your word is our hope. Bless those we have known and loved who are now in your nearer presence. Especially today, we lift Beth to you and give you thanks for her participation in our congregation. Be with those who are even now coming into your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, hear our voices. Let your ears be attentive to our supplications. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. Our worship will continue now with the offering. If you'd like to, you can pause our worship video, go over to our homepage, graceboon.org. There you'll find a drop-down to donate in support of our mission to share God's love so that all are served and supported. Boy, little boys and old to Jesus, he will embrace me.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and call us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The blessing of God, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.